them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took the children up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. If you've been with us over the last several weeks, then you know that we've been involved in a series of sermons on the letter of James under the general theme, Practical Christianity. And you may recall that we began this series of sermons back in August by exploring what James has to say about such practical issues as, as dealing with trouble and living out our faith in the kind of competitive dog-eat-dog -dog world in which we live. We, we've looked at what he had to say about the impact that our words can have uh, on the people around us and, and even the way we go about making decisions. Well, this morning we come to the conclusion of our series of sermons by, by looking at those uh, last words that James has in his, his letter. And if you were listening very carefully as Ashley read our first lesson this morning, then you know that James concludes his letter by encouraging those of us in the church, those of us who are Christians, to, to pray for one another and to be a source of healing to one another sing songs of praise together and, and confess our sins to one another and, and even go out and bring back uh, those who have wandered away from the faith. In a word, James, James encourages those of us to exhibit the very power of, of Christian community. Now why? Why do you suppose James ends his letter in this way? Uh, do you know what I believe? I believe that James ends his letter the way he does, partly because James knows that this is the very dream that Christ has for his church, Christian community. But I also think he did it partly because James had discovered for himself what, what Christian community can mean in a person's life. You'll remember that in all probability, the author of this letter, James, was the younger brother of Jesus. And that means that they had probably grown up together. But then came that decisive moment when, when Jesus began his ministry and, and he began it by gathering around him a small group of, of 12 disciples. And he invited James, isn't that interesting? He invited his younger brother to be one of those disciples. And over the next three years, this, this small band of followers just kind of did life. Together, They lived together and they ate together and they did ministry together and they, they went out on mission trips and then they came back and they celebrated what they had experienced. And yes, there were times when they didn't always agree with one another, but in the presence of Jesus, even these occasions became opportunities for them to grow closer together. And so this, during this three-year period, the, these disciples learn to love one another and support one another and, and care for one another. And James had, had taken note of, of how all of this had had a transforming effect on each one of their lives, how, how it had helped them to be bigger and better people than they already were, how, how they were able to discover a meaning and a purpose to life that they had not had previously and how they were even able to make a difference. And, in the world around them. And so partly because James knew that Christian community was Christ's dream for the church, and, and partly, I think, because he had discovered for himself what it could mean in a person's life. He, he, he wanted to end his letter on this high note of talking about Christian community. Well, this week, as I was reflecting on all of this and on this passage of Scripture, I, I couldn't help but think about times in my own life when I've experienced Christian community. I thought, for example, of, of a time when, 
when Carol and I had first started our ministry at the time, I was serving, we were serving a church that had about 60 or 80 people in, a, in attendance on Sunday mornings. And, and we were at that church for about three years. And then at one point during that three-year period, we decided to start a small group. And interestingly enough, we had 12 people in that small group. We met at the home of, uh, of Mitch and Sue Ellerby, and, and uh, we all had committed to meet every week. And Sue had a small child, and Carol and I had a small child, and so we kept them in the den. We met in the living room, and, and I remember that during the first part of our time together, we would just share our, our joys and concerns with one another. If someone had had a conflict with with a colleague, we would talk about that. Or if someone had gotten a promotion at work, we, we'd talk a little bit about that. Or maybe one of the moms had, had just reached the edge of her endurance with, with the children, and we'd talk about that for a little while. And, and, and then after we'd gone all the way around the room, and we were not in a hurry with these things, then we'd just pray for one another. And that usually took about 45 minutes or, or so. And, and then after that, we would go and we'd break and we'd have some refreshments. And then we'd come back and, and we'd study the scriptures. And we'd just kind of dig in. And, and then we'd try to apply those scriptures to, to the everyday living of our lives in, in our various contexts. And, and as we did this, over time, we began to notice this amazing thing happened. We just kind of grew incredibly close to one another, so close that, that if you could today, if you could just once again gather this group together, and you can't because some of them have gone on to glory, but if you could, every single one of them would tell you about the transforming effect that this had had on their lives, and I thought about that. And I thought about a time uh, prior to that, when I was just a teenager, I, I was a part of the youth group of, of the church where I grew up. It was about a, I don't know, an 1800, 2000 member church, something like that. And, and I was a member of the youth group there. But then at one point, when I was about 17 years of age, I, I did something that I was just sure. It was the unforgivable sin. I was just convinced that there was no way that Christ could ever forgive me for what I had done. And some of you are wondering right now, what did he do? <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> but in my mind, it was the unforgivable sin. It, it really, looking back, it wasn't as bad as you might think it was. But I remember I, I, I kind of just pulled away from the church. And that next Sunday morning, I wasn't in church, which parenthetically, let me just say that it's at the very moment when you sin that you shouldn't pull away from the church. You should actually come to church. But I pulled away that Sunday morning. But that Sunday night, I, I, I went back to the church. Our church had Sunday night services. Anybody in here ever remember Sunday night services? Yeah, and, and so usually on a Sunday night, there'd be about 200 people that would gather on the main floor of our church, and, and we'd have services. And that night, I sat way in the corner of the balcony all by myself. And, and at our church on Sunday nights, we always had altar calls or altar prayers. And, uh, and apparently the the preacher had seen me sitting up there by myself and just instinctively, intuitively knew that I, there was something going on in my life. And so when he came to the time where he invited the congregation to come to the altar for altar prayers, he looked up and he called me out. He said, Dan, I want you down here at this altar. Well, you know, what could I do? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I went to the altar. And I remember I knelt at that altar and I could take you to the place this very moment. And I knelt at that altar and I began to open my heart up to God. And I just kind of confessed all of it and asked God to forgive me. And while I was praying, I, I remembered that there was one person 
who put a hand on my shoulder and then another person and then another person and, and then there was a hand on my head and another and, and by the time I finished my prayer I, I turned around and stood up and there were literally dozens of people gathered around me praying for me that night. Can you understand what I mean when I say to you that that night changed my life? And I'm not sure today I'd be in the church if it hadn't been for that night. So I, 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 reading the book of James I, I, and the scripture, I thought about all of these different things. And then I started thinking about some of the people in this church. I, I thought about a man that I talked with not long ago who told me how he had gone through a very difficult time, but then this church kind of came around him and loved him and supported him through it and, and how that had had such a profound impact on his life that, that today he feels like he owes the church a debt that he could never hope to repay. I thought about Liz Thayer and her funeral. And uh, Dick and Emily were in the early service this morning and Dick had given me permission to share this, this story. But, you know, right after the news broke, this church just kind of rallied around Dick and Jeff and Emily and their families. And, and I thought about that. And I thought about the meal providers who took food out to them and made sure that their needs were taken care of. And I, and I thought about the funeral committee and how the members of that committee were just kind of there to walk them through all of the steps in that experience. You know, you can go through, go to a lot of different funeral services and see things take place, but when it happens in your family, it's very different, and it helps to have someone there to kind of walk you through the steps, and I watched the funeral committee do that, and I watched the Sunday school class come around them and, and, and provide the reception for them afterwards, and during the reception, I, I, I I didn't even try to go and talk to Dick or Emily or Jeff because there were just too many of you who were around them, loving them and caring for them and supporting them. And I don't mean to be exclusive by just calling Liz Thayer's name because the truth of the matter is I, I, I've seen this happen maybe 20 or 30 times since I've been here at this church. It's just that Liz's is the most recent, and, and, and so it's kind of fresh on my mind. Well, I thought about all of these, these different things. Why? Because I think this was the sort of thing that was in James's mind. I, I think James ended the letter the way he did because he knew that what Christian community could mean in a person's life, and because he knew it was the dream that Christ had for his church. I think he wanted us to see that when Christian community is working the way that Christ intended for it to work, then it can be a place of healing. It can be a source of healing. It can be a place of forgiveness. It can have a transforming effect on our lives. Right before this service this morning, I, 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 the early service. I bumped into Bob Levinson. Bob's seated right over here this morning. And, and I saw Bob and we were just talking and, you know, Bob was in the hospital for a while and man, it was a serious situation. And then, and then when he was released, I think it was the first Sunday after you were released, wasn't it? You know, you were back in church on Sunday morning. Charlene helped him get into church and, and make it here. But he was in church. and So as we were talking, I just said, why? Why? And he said, because this is the place where I became a Christian. It can have a transforming effect on our lives. It can give us meaning and purpose. That's what Christian community can do. And I think James wanted us to see that. I also think he wanted to challenge those of us who are in the church to do some introspection and to ask ourselves some questions. Questions like, are we the kind of Christian community that other people need for us to be? 
Is every Sunday school class and every small group in this church a place where people are welcomed and accepted at Wednesday night suppers? Do we just kind of circle around a table with our close friends and, and other people are just sort of left to sit by themselves? Or do we make an effort to reach out and, and include other people into the circle of our friends? Do we make an intentional effort to, to invite our friends and colleagues and acquaintances to this church to discover for themselves Christian community? I think James wanted us to ask these sorts of questions. So this morning, I, as we come to the close, at least of this sermon, I want to ask you to do, do two things, and it's been sort of a twofold purpose in this morning's sermon. If you're not a part of a small group, if you're not connected in some way with a, a Bible study or, a, or a, a men's group or a women's group or a, a, a Sunday school class, or some other small group, I want to encourage you to intentionally think about that and to make an effort to do that. And if you are a part of a group, then I, I want to encourage you to look for ways that you can intentionally invite other people into, your, into the circle of Christ's love. Will you do that? Will you do that? I hope you will. I really do hope you will. Because it might, it might just change the world for someone. It might just change the world for you. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is the good news for this morning.